Don Lewis was born as Jack Donald Lewis on April 30, 1938 in Dade City, Florida. In Don's early years as a child, his father abandoned the family and left Don's mother to raise him and his two siblings. While Don's mother did her best to support her children through freelance gigs as a for-hire seamstress and bread baker, her income wasn't quite enough. Thus, to help aid his mother and take care of the family, Don started working at a young age, forming the foundation to his business ethics. As an adolescent, Don helped out a local mechanic and worked as a farmhand for nearby ranch owners and successfully graduated from Pasco High School in 1955. When he was only 17 years old, Don married his first wife, known today as Gladys Lewis Cross. Together, the couple had three daughters and adopted a son. Just as Don continued to expand his economic prowess, he worked countless odd jobs around Florida and eventually settled in the used car business and automotive trade. Slowly but surely, Don built his brand scrapping old machines, selling parts and metal resources while simultaneously investing in real estate opportunities. Don would buy parcels of land to develop and resell, sometimes keeping tracts of land for himself for future business ideas. Before long, Don was a self-made millionaire and the prime example of the American dream in action, starting from nothing and forging his own path to success. Friends and associates of Don would say that no one could tell his success just by looking at him. He always dressed like a normal laborer and kept his public life simple. However, he would keep a $500 bill in his pocket at all times, a symbol of his ability to turn anything he touched into profits, a true, green thumb. However, Don's personal life wasn't quite so perfect. It was a well-known fact after his first marriage that he was a womanizer and often found mistresses or second girlfriends to take care of, despite having the family back home. One such instance occurred in 1981, when Don met a young woman named Carol Murdoch at the time on Nebraska Avenue in Tampa, Florida. Carol was walking alone at night and crying after struggling with her then-husband, Michael Murdoch. Don asked Carol if she needed a ride, and initially, Carol rejected him. However, Don circled around in his truck anyway, even offering the gun in his passenger seat to Carol to use as protection while he drove, explaining that he needed someone to talk to as well. Carol finally agreed, and after conversing with one another for a while, Carol stayed with him that night, and the two fell in love. Of course, this sent shockwaves through Don's family. And tensions arose between him and his then-wife Gladys. Nevertheless, Don continued his relationship with Carol, who joined his real estate business and helped increase his profits through major land sales. Not long afterwards, Don and Carol's relationship became too serious to ignore, and they divorced their respective spouses and married in 1991. With the excess money from Don's empire, he brought his new cat-loving wife, a bobcat, called Winsong, at an auction. The couple then began buying big cats from a breeder in Minnesota, who was planning on slaughtering them for the fur trade. As was perhaps in his nature, Don viewed this as another chance to create a business. And in 1992, founded Wildlife on Easy Street with Carol and what would later become Big Cat Rescue. Carol, however, thought the initiative should be a charity, not just for profit. But Don disagreed and slowly tensions arose between the two. Over the next few years, Don continued developing wildlife on easy streets and started buying more animals. In 1995, he bought his first tiger from Dennis Hall and around the same time was beginning the process of taking his beloved emporium and moving it to Costa Rica, where he'd been buying vast tracts of land and making connections and associates on the tropical island. At the same time, others began thinking that Don was using Costa Rica as a means to attract women unbeknownst to Carol and escaping away with Costa Rican mistresses. This continued to damage the pair's relationship and soon it fell beyond repair. In early 1997, Don Lewis began preparing for divorce, gathering his assets together and planning for a future away from Carol. Carol claims that at this same time, he began showing early signs of dementia, his short-term memory declining while digging through dumpsters and collecting junk for seemingly no good reason. Don's lawyer and business associates later said this wasn't proven, and they had never witnessed Don in a worsening state of mind. Regardless, Don's frantic behavior did include a growing fear of Carol. And in June of 1997, he filed a restraining order against her after she verbally threatened to kill him. 
According to Don, Carol was in possession of multiple guns, but the courts never granted him protection. Due to her freedoms of speech under the First Amendment and they felt she posed no true physical harm to him. Don was a worried man and soon his paranoia was proven correct when at the end of that same summer, the threats, confusion, and anxiety gave way to a tragic mystery. Let us now review the timeline of events that led to the disappearance of Don Lewis. In June of 1997, Don Lewis begins exhibiting signs of paranoia, anxiety, and fear. Centering around his then-wife, Carol Lewis, now known as Carol Baskin. He gives his executive assistant at the time, and McQueen, an envelope containing a restraining order against Carol to be submitted to the local courts. This document contains unnerving quotes by Don, such as, quote, This is the second time Carol has gotten angry enough to threaten to kill me. Carol got in a big fuss. She ordered me out the house or she would kill me. She has a .45 revolver and she took my .357 and hit it. Later that June, the Florida courts deny protection from the restraining order, saying Carol is no immediate threat and that the First Amendment, granting free speech, allows her to say such things without consequence. Throughout the summer, Don's erratic behavior continues. He tells his former wife Gladys and a couple of their children to stay away from Carol, that he's done with her and planning to divorce her. He speaks his final words to them, saying Carol is one of the worst people and quite dangerous. Not long after this encounter, Don repeats the same information about his probable divorce to business associate Wendell Williams. Don signals to Wendell that he is putting most of his possessions in a protective state that would allow him to keep most of what he owned and away from a settlement. Sometime in July of 1997, Don gets together with another friend, Mike McCarthy, and tells him that he feels his life is in danger. As July turns to August, Don informs his lawyer, Joseph Fritz, he's in search of another small passenger plane to add to his collection of planes. He finds one he likes, but the aircraft needs work to be able to fly for longer durations of time. At some point during the first two and a half weeks of that same August, Don has a conversation with his longtime handyman of 15 years, Kenny Four, while they build a new complex cage for the big cats. Don remarks that he has vague plans of some sort. Plans he never fully explains to Kenny, but is intent on carrying out. At the end of their talk, Don says, quote, If I can pull this off, it will have been the slickest thing I've ever done in my life. Before Kenny can ask for clarity, Don leaves to attend a phone call and never finishes his thoughts. It would be the last thing Don ever says to Kenny. On Friday, August 15th, Don's assistant and McQueen calls Don regarding paperwork for cars he's preparing to take down to Costa Rica. Despite multiple attempts to reach him by phone and isn't able to make contact. And continues calling throughout that weekend but she still has no luck. In the evening of August 17th, Don prepares to drive down to Miami and then travel on to Costa Rica. He tells Carol he needs a truck made available for travel by his handyman Kenny, but it's unknown if he ever secures one. That night and into the early morning hours of August 18th, Carol makes her own plans to do chores and run errands for the Big Cat Resort. At around 3 a.m., Carol goes to a shop called Albertsons to buy milk byproduct for the cats. Her car breaks down, but she's saved by her brother, a local sheriff's deputy, who gives her a ride back to her home. Just a few hours later, a little prior to 6 a.m. on August 18, 1997, Don Lewis leaves his house to make an early delivery of real estate paperwork to his lawyer's main office and then to travel to Miami and ultimately Costa Rica. This would be the last confirmed sighting of Jack Donald Lewis. Nearly 36 hours pass by and no one hears from Don and calls Carol with real concern and suggests they get the authorities involved. Carol agrees and at about 1.30 p.m. on August 19th, she telephones law enforcement to officially report Don Lewis as a missing person. In the first 24 hours after the missing person's report is filed, police and a few volunteers comb Don's entire 40-acre property in Tampa, Florida, including the Wildlife on Easy Street Resort. Despite a thorough search, including aerial support, detectives find no clues or anything to suggest they should continue digging at Don's residence. On August 20th, the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office discovers Don's personal van, a 1989 Dodge Ram, parked and abandoned at the Pilot Country Airport in Spring Hill, Florida, about 40 miles away from Don's last appearance at his animal sanctuary. 
Besides the keys to the van and a briefcase full of insignificant documents, nothing of note is found inside the vehicle and the trail of clues is frozen once again. Over the next four to five days, detectives traveled down to Costa Rica to progress the manhunt. While investigating every nook and cranny possible, law enforcement discovers Don had been engaged in extramarital affairs whilst in Costa Rica. They interview possible connections to Don and those who knew of the businessman, but still find zero leads. The only thing remarkable that investigators learn is that two of Don's exotic animals, a pair of ocelots, were shipped out just before Don disappeared. Where they went is still unknown. Initial reports, once Don's disappearance reaches national headlines, date that they believe Don probably walked away on his own. But as time goes on, both the media and investigators start thinking something more sinister is at play. A few days after the one-year anniversary of Don's vanishing on August 23, 1998, Carol refuses to take a polygraph test or allow investigators to carry out an intensive search of her wildlife sanctuary or the meat freezers, citing legal advice from her attorney. Later in 1998, Don Lewis's ex-wife Gladys and their daughters publicly accused Carol of being responsible for Don's fate and discarding the body via the exotic animals they own. This is heavily refuted by Carol. In August 2002, on the five-year and one-day mark since he first disappeared, Don is declared legally dead by Carol and his wills are put solely in her possession due to the specific verbiage used in his documents. Nine years later in 2011, Carol is asked one more time by investigators to undergo a polygraph test. Once again, she refuses this request. Over the next decade, countless conspiracies and folk tales are created by curious bystanders of the case and by those with ties to Don, his ex-wife Carol, and their big cat business. However, John Mariscano, the lead homicide detective and spokesman of the investigation for Hillsborough County Sheriff, has shot down any and all gossip. In April of 2020, stating that authorities have no prime suspects, no leads, and still no updates regarding the disappearance of Don Lewis, a case just as cold as it had been in that early August morning, 23 years before. Not a lot of physical evidence remains in the Don Lewis disappearance. And without a final phone call recording leftover or CCTV footage capturing Don's penultimate movements, there's not much to run with. However, one discovery does provide us at least a hint of what happened to Don before he vanished, even if it does bring more confusion than clarity. The day after Don was reported missing, investigators discovered his 1989 Dodge Ram van. Discarded at the Pilot Country Airport in Spring Hill, Florida. The airport was about 40 miles, give or take, from Don's personal residence and initially thought to be where he flew out of that August morning. The troubling thing was that almost nothing was left behind in the van, and the things that were did not preclude a self-made decision to escape. Inside were the van's keys and Don's briefcase full of random papers. Unfortunately, the police did not impound the vehicle right away. Leaving it abandoned in that parking lot, allowing for possible tampering and for critical physical evidence to be removed if there was something hidden on the atomic level. When the police did analyze the forensics, they found nothing but normal traces of Dawn and a second pair of fingerprints belonging to an auto mechanic, Dale Lively. When law enforcement interviewed Dale, he gave proof of a perfectly innocent explanation, stating a few days before the disappearance, Dawn had swung by the shop and asked Dale to work on the van. During their interaction, Don also asked Dale to come with him to Costa Rica to help on his land, further indicating that Don was fully committed to a southward trip. Dale declined, and the van situation became just another dead end in a case full of questions without answers. Many people associated with the case believe the van is a sign that Don was kidnapped and not a sign that he left on his own accord. Detectives agree. Thinking the van was planted at the airport, either to simply get rid of it or to make investigators think it was Don's final stop. Regardless, the amount of time it took authorities to analyze the insides of the van for forensics creates a massive what-if in the search for Dawn. And it is sadly the biggest clue they've received to date. One which may have been regrettably squandered. With the facts of the case understood, now let's turn to the dominant theories. In the case of the disappearance of Don Lewis. Like so many cold cases around the world, the disappearance of Don Lewis has been the fodder for some truly outlandish claims and conspiracies sparked by both family members and those with disdain for Don's former partners. 
Sadly, these brash and borderline barbaric theories have been glamorized and focused on by one particular documentary series and its ensuing publicity. So we will do our best to dissect each theory with clarity and reasoning backed by evidence to properly respect the facts of the case and the man who went missing. It's our belief that truth and respect to the facts of the case should always take precedence. And it is insulting to Don Luce's memory and potentially damaging to his case to sacrifice these in the pursuit of an overdramatized quote-unquote good story. The first real theory purported by those involved with Don Lewis's personal life came from his daughters and his first ex-wife Gladys Lewis Cross in 1998, only one year after Don went missing. They made a public interview in People magazine theorizing that Carol Baskin had indeed killed Don and then dispose of his body via a meat grinder and then feeding it to her tigers at the Big Cat Rescue Sanctuary. Donna Pettis, one of Don's daughters, felt the police didn't do a thorough enough job searching the property and should have carried out forensic analysis on Carol's meat grinder, testing it for Don's DNA. Carol has vehemently denied such possibilities, claiming the meat grinder in question was too small to even handle something like a human hand, let alone an entire full-grown adult male body. Not only this, but what many people fail to realize and what one documentary fails to make widely known is that the meat grinder in question was removed from the Big Cat Rescue weeks before Don went missing, confirmed by the sheriff's office investigating Don's case. And if Carol did try to use a corpse as food for her big cats, there's absolutely no way bones and forensic evidence would not be left behind. The acidity of a tiger's stomach is strong, but not strong enough to completely destroy human remains. There would be a significant amount of bones, blood and tissue left over. And to try to clean up every bit of the leftovers and leave absolutely no hints of the act is too far-fetched to believe. Such a vile act, even if utilized, would leave behind too much evidence and investigators certainly would have picked up on something. Nevertheless, these outlandish claims only picked up steam when notorious big cat collector and nemesis of Carol Baskin, Joe Exotic, created an obscene music video, flaunting the tiger-feeding hypothesis. But that wasn't his only crazy claim. Joe Exotic became obsessed with another theory that while Carol was still responsible for her husband's disappearance, she actually hid his body under the ground at Big Cat Rescue, digging up the dirt where her septic tank rested and putting Don's body in that, covering it up and pretending as if nothing had happened. Joe made many public pleas for investigators to excavate the earth around the property and check the septic tank. And this idea spread around his own exotic zoo where employees began believing that same conclusion. However, the documentaries covering Joe and his theories also failed to share the information that debunks his theory as well. The septic tank in question, in a similar vein to the meat grinder, was not installed on the Big Cat Rescue Sanctuary. Until multiple years after Don went missing. If Don was buried somewhere on the property, it was nowhere near the septic tank. In addition, it makes little sense for Carol to bury Don on her own property, where future digs and construction work will almost assuredly take place and risk discovery. Now, all this being said, to completely remove Carol Baskin as a suspect would be premature. While she has consistently denied any involvement, there are pieces to her past that might suggest a motive or at least further consideration. The major piece of the case that might preclude motivation for Carol is Don's promiscuity and overall stance on the wildlife projects he and Carol had created. It is well known that Don saw the tigers and various big cats as nothing more than a business and thought of it as a means to make money rather than any real charity. While they were initially together in that viewpoint, Carol eventually wanted the sanctuary to be exactly that, a place where rescued cats could live approved by fellow activists, saving them from immoral breeding and cub abuse. This requires a lot of money. And Carol had Don to fall back on. Son in Don's inner circle said he hated losing his money to her spending and that being a millionaire married to someone without much money is a treacherous combination. But we mustn't pretend that Don was perfect either. He was also involved in various extramarital affairs, having multiple girlfriends despite his marriage to Carol, including a secret mistress down in Costa Rica. With a clashing philosophy and a dying marriage, Carol may have sought to end what was becoming a toxic situation. In fact, pages from her personal diaries exposed by various sources found entries written by Carol stating things such as, quote, not to mention her verbal threats. 
Eventually, her wish was granted, and most suspiciously of all, Carol Baskin did end up the biggest beneficiary of Don's vanishing. Not long after he went missing, Carol cut off all the utilities to Don's office, took out his wills and powers of attorney, and held on to them until the very first date she was allowed to declare him legally dead, the five-year and one-day anniversary of his disappearance. Even stranger. Was that when the powers of attorney were read, lawyers found that a special clause had been written granting Carol head of Don's estate, not after his death, but specifically after his disappearance. Multiple lawyers have said this is an irregular clause for such legal documents, as people rarely expect to disappear. Not only that, but Carol ended up inheriting 90% of Don's worth, leaving just 10% behind for Don's former family. Now, it should be stated that Don had instructed Carol to leave them with 0%, but she decided to help them regardless, citing their blood relationship to Don as meaningful. Does the strange disappearance clause in Don's will, combined with his infidelity and strict business-minded pursuits make Carol the killer? No, but it does raise suspicion in her motivations as millions of dollars were at stake to keep her dream of saving big cats alive. Some have pointed out that just because she had Dawn legally declared dead the first day possible doesn't mean she was the mastermind either. And they have a point. Wouldn't it be ridiculously obvious to carry out such a suspicious legal action? If Carol was indeed at fault, drawing attention to the matter wouldn't be her priority. It's also possible that she wasn't the killer, but rather had blood on her hands, arranging for someone else to handle Dawn. It is undoubtedly deeply suspicious. There are many people afraid of Carol, including Don himself, but fear, circumstantial evidence, and speculation unfortunately does not mean the party is guilty without physical evidence. Of course, Carol Baskin isn't the only one subject to theories of involvement. In fact, many people wonder if Don wasn't involved with anything malicious or any third party at all, but rather left on his own accord or died trying to do so. With his vast resources and millions of dollars, Don certainly had the capital necessary to pull off a stunt and escape his previous life. Perhaps he was done with the big cat operation and the hassle of dealing with such a consuming business. Perhaps his affairs with women were catching up with him and he wanted to start over, or perhaps he was truly fearful of Carol and set up his estate so she would profit over his disappearance while he got to start over on the far side of the world. These theorists believe Don faked a kidnapping, fully intending to fly out of Miami that August morning and never return. He could have put his van in a different airport parking lot to throw police off his trail, hopped on another flight, and vanished in the blink of an eye. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Don had money outside of his known estate or was saving up for this exact scenario. Don was full of secrets and constantly plotting his next move, preparing for the future are better than most. In fact, Don's personal handyman, Kenny Four, told reporters he knew Don would bury money and gold bars around his various properties and was probably worth around 20 million, 15 million more than his lawyers thought. Remember that Kenny was the person Don told, quote, if I can pull this off, it will be the slickest thing I've ever done in my life. Could it have been a great escape plan? Many think it to be possible. But not Kenny. He doesn't understand why Don would leave a van at an airport at all, even if it wasn't the right one. It would be too big a clue that Don was running away and make it much harder to become invisible. Both Don's lawyer, Joseph Fritz, and lead investigator of Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, John Marcicano agree, saying Don was more likely to have been killed. The other arguments that Don left on his own will, but perished unexpectedly, is also heavily gossiped. Some followers of the case, including Carol Baskin herself, think that Don may have got into one of his planes to fly to Costa Rica, but crashed somewhere in the ocean. There is, however, a lot of evidence to suggest this is false. Detective Marcicano points to the lack of flight records going to Costa Rica that day, and the lack of crash reports in the area for the same timeline. Theorists then report that Don was a known illegal flyer, having lost his pilot's license, but choosing to fly anyway operating his planes low and under radar detection. Yet again, Detective Masicano refutes these claims, saying every plane Don owned was far too small to make the trip to Costa Rica in one go. If Don did get in a plane and attempt to travel south, it would have been desperate and unsafe, possibly hinting at a deteriorating state of mind that some have claimed that Don was suffering from before he disappeared. 
As previously noted, Dawn was experiencing symptoms of onset dementia and may have been overcome with fatigue, paranoia, or a combination of the two. This would explain his ramblings to his friends about being in fear for his life and constantly looking over his shoulder, conspiring against his then-wife, Carol. The problem with this theory though, is that if Don was truly dealing with memory loss and dementia, he would not be able to successfully vanish without a trace so easily. If his mental faculties were becoming compromised, surely he would have made a mistake somewhere. Plus, a lot of close associates to Don don't believe the dementia stories anyway, saying he was of sound mind and honestly genuinely terrified for his life. So if it doesn't appear that Carol killed Don and it wasn't Don who left by choice, who was responsible for his disappearance? A few people think Joe Exotic was actually the one to blame. Wondering if he may have taken Don out to spite Carol and derail the future of wildlife on Easy Street, claiming the validity in such a conspiracy, knowing John was guilty of other plots against Carol's life. However, it should be noted that Joe and Carol's bitter rivalry did not exist in 1997, and no such evidence supports this idea. A few others point to militant animal rights activists. Or think that Don had connections to drug lords in South America that wanted him dead. Regardless, the fact of the matter is the police have no hard evidence and have no prime suspects in their sights. Anyone could be at fault. And that's what makes Don Lewis's disappearance all the more tragic. Tara Calico was born February 28, 1969 to parents David and Patty Calico in New Mexico, the land of enchantment in an ordinary world. Tara was an adventurous young girl and grew up exploring the great outdoors, joined by her siblings and friends around the area. During childhood, her mother and father divorced and Tara remained with Patty, who remarried to John Dole and moved to Belen, another regular New Mexico suburb. Belen is the primary seat of Valencia County, New Mexico, taking its name from the Spanish translation of Bethlehem, the legendary biblical town. It's the transportation hub of the greater Valencia area and primarily a Catholic and Christian demographic. When the Dole family moved to Belen, it seemed like the quintessential place to raise Tara and her siblings, Michelle and Chris. It was perfectly quaint without a controversy or worry in the world. It's a place described as, quote, small town America, where everyone knows everyone, everyone looks after everyone and no one is outside the realms of safety. Its main economic turnstile was ranching and it offered many recreational possibilities across its welcoming landscape. This meant it was the perfect place for Tara to engage in her exploratory tendencies, free from the fear of sinister consequences. As Tara entered adolescence and young adulthood, she became a beloved member of her high school class by schoolmates and close friends alike. They described her as an athletic, yet highly intelligent individual with an innate kindness not often seen from children her age. She was admired by her peers and revered by her teachers who noticed her undying responsibility and knack for extreme organization, a trait that would be highlighted. After her disappearance. A story told by Melinda Escabel, a friend of Tara's, described her as a friend to anyone. Melinda had joined the marching band in high school and at the time had no one else to confide in or hang out with in the band. When Tara saw Melinda sitting by herself one day, she took this new girl into her circle of friends despite knowing nothing about her. A selfless act of building a better atmosphere for her peers. And a memory that stuck with Melinda well after the fact. After high school concluded, Tara decided to attend college and study psychology, a subject that always fascinated her. She chose the University of New Mexico Valencia branch, which also happened to be Melinda's school of choice as well. The two would see each other frequently and often spoke during moments of freedom. It was around this time that Tara also started dating former high school classmates, Jack Cole. A captain of their football team and well-liked student-athlete. The two met at a social event with mutual friends after they graduated and started a relationship soon after. They always talked about traveling the states and country together and often stayed active while dating. This was the preferred lifestyle for Tara, who was a religious biker and outdoor enthusiast. And sadly, it was the first domino to a fateful collapse when on September 20, 1988, Belen, New Mexico would forever be transformed from the idyllic American community to a dark spot of mystery, tragedy, and controversy. 
In the early waking hours of Tuesday morning, September 20, 1988, at around 9 a.m., Tara Calico wakes up and sets out her clothes and school books on her bed. She preps to leave her Belen, New Mexico home to ride her bicycle along New Mexico State Road 47. A daily routine frequented by Calico and her mother, Patty. At this point, however, Patty has quit riding with her daughter after getting the feeling a motorist was stalking her during their trek. She urges Tara to ride with Mace hidden on her person, but Tara rejects the idea. Sometime after 9.15 a.m., Tara asks Patty to come pick her up along the highway if she hasn't returned by noon. When Patty asks why, Tara reveals that she intends to play tennis with her then-boyfriend at 12.30 p.m. that day, followed by college classes at 3.30 p.m. At about 9.30 a.m., Tara leaves her house on her mother's bicycle, a 10-speed pink Huffy brand due to her own bike having a flat tire. The neon bike also came with yellow control cables and sidewalls, very distinguishable characteristics. This would be Tara Calico's last confirmed contact with her friends or family. Over the next two hours, between 9.30 a.m. and 11.15 a.m., Tara bikes approximately 17 miles to the southern railroad tracks outside of town, her usual route. The ride is assumedly normal without hassle, and she turns around to start the ride home so she can get ready for her tennis date. At around 11.30 a.m., Tara is seen on the pink bicycle riding northbound towards her home by two unidentified ranch hands along State Route 47. Nearly 15 minutes later at 11.45 a.m., three men drive southbound on the other lane of the 47. They are driving home from a hunting excursion and pass by Tara on her bicycle. However, they notice something very eerie as a white pickup truck tails her very closely. They note Tara is listening to music on her Walkman with headphones and seems ignorant to the pursuant truck behind her. Not long after the second sighting, another driver in the south lane passes Tara and also witnesses the white truck tailing her, just under five miles away from the Rio communities. This driver claims he noticed the ominous truck contained multiple occupants and not just a solo driver. This is the last confirmed sighting of Tara Calico. Five minutes past noon, Patty Duell stays true to her word and sets out to pick up Tara per her daughter's request. She drives up and down the railroad tracks both ways along Route 47, but makes no sighting of her daughter or the pink bike. Patty even calls a nearby hospital to check and see if Tara had an accident and was admitted, but no one matching her description is accounted for. Patty then rounds up a few of Tara's friends to help search, but not a trace is found. They finally give in and call the Valencia County Sheriff's Office where a police search party begins. The following day, on September 21st, the search team discovers a set of bicycle tracks on the west side of Route 47, four miles from the Rio communities and even closer to Terra's last sighting. The bike tracks veer from the side of the road onto a soft shoulder and towards a location about 100 yards away from the highway. This new location has actual tire tracks, as well as a fresh oil slick. From here, police find a trail of footprints that leads them to their biggest find in the case thus far. Tara's cassette tapes of the rock band Boston, the broken front plastic window piece to the Walkman device and empty beer can strewn about. Between September 21st and the 23rd, law enforcement doubles their search efforts around State Route 47. On Saturday, September 24th, investigators find the remaining pieces. Tara's broken Walkman around the entrance of John F. Kennedy Campground at the base of the Manzano Mountains. The area is remote, unpopulated, and only 20 miles away from the initial discovery. Throughout that same weekend, the Ventura County Sheriff's Office dispatches more than 300 air and land searchers to patrol the river and Manzo Mountains, but find nothing out of the ordinary and retreat on Tuesday, September 27th. In the following days and weeks, authorities seek out any and all witnesses to Tara's final bike ride on the 20th. They find seven people who claim to have seen Tara, five of which also claim to have seen the white pickup truck following her. Four of these individuals are even hypnotized in an attempt to pull more details, but nothing concrete is learned. Law enforcement also eliminates possible evidence such as a biking water bottle found in a nearby yard, a patch of uneven dirt alongside Route 47, a connection to the September 1985 disappearance of Deborah Lansdell, and three men who were found drinking beer in the back of a pickup truck soon after Tara's vanishing. 
Their alibis, the beer they were drinking was Budweiser, and the empty beer cans found near Tara's broken Walkman were Old Milwaukee. One month later, on October 25th, lead investigator, Sheriff Lawrence Romero, tells the public their main suspects are believed to be two males, based on the report that the white pickup truck was seen with two men inside. The driver is described as 35 to 45 years old, white with red hair, standing 5 foot 9 to 6 foot and weighing 200 pounds, and most interestingly, with wrinkles between his eyes and temples. The truck itself is detailed as a white 1950s to 1960s Ford pickup model with a camper shell, chrome hubcaps, large tires, and the Ford emblem spelled in smashed red glass letters. Its license plate starts with WBY or WBZ and ends in the number 6. Again, weeks go by and hundreds of calls and hotline tips pour in regarding the suspect and the vehicle announcement made by police, leading to a few interviews. But no arrests are made and the case begins to grow cold. On June 15, 1989, an unnamed woman in Port St. Joe, Florida, comes to police with a Polaroid photograph she found in the parking lot of a convenience store. The picture displays a young female adult and a young boy duct-taped at the mouth and bound at the wrists, laying in the back of a van. This Polaroid is broadcast across the country. And relatives of Patty Dole call her to inform her that the girl in the disturbing photograph bears a striking resemblance to Tara. Patty flies to Florida to take a closer look and agrees that the woman in the shot looks like her daughter. Over the next year, two more photographs are submitted to authorities that show a young female bound and gagged in a similar fashion, but feature a different woman than the one in the original Port St. Joe photograph. While all three are believed to potentially involve Tara Calico, none have ever been confirmed to contain her image, and their status is left up to debate among government agencies and amateur sleuths alike. Decades pass, and Tara Calico's disappearance remains unsolved. Despite endless searches around New Mexico by countless investigators and private contractors, little evidence is ever uncovered surrounding the case. In September of 2008, 20 years after the fateful morning, the then-sheriff of Ventura County, Rene Rivera, comes out with a statement alleging he knew who kidnapped and killed Tara. But without any incriminating evidence or bodies to exhume, the conclusion could only remain a theory. His wasn't the only hypothesis circulating the news. And as his peculiar confession wears down on the followers of the case, so does the coverage of Tara's mystery. In 2013, a task force was created different federal and local agents to reopen the investigation. But over seven years later, and nothing new has surfaced regarding Tara Calico or her mother's pink neon huffy bike. When people familiar with the Tara Calico disappearance think of her cold case, the first image that pops into their head is the suspicious Polaroid photograph found by a woman at the Port St. Joe's convenience store in June of 1989. As previously mentioned, the picture appears to show a young woman and a little boy held against their will, trapped in the back of a van without an identity or story. After the woman turned the Polaroid into the police, she mentioned that the parking spot where it had been found was actually occupied by a white Toyota van when she arrived at the store, leaving seconds before her return to the parking lot. The woman was able to catch a quick glimpse of the driver and stated he was middle-aged and mustached, probably in his late 30s. Immediately, the suspicions of the photo began to click. The white van could easily be the van that houses the bound woman and child from the image. Could this van be the source? Could the driver be the kidnapper? Or could this all be a prank? The woman, authorities, and local newscasters didn't think so. They started investigating right away and sent the Polaroid to a current affair, where it was nationally televised. Now here comes the connection to Terra Calico. Friends of the Dole family watched a current affair and felt that the Port St. Joe pitcher's female subject bore a striking resemblance to Terra. They telephoned Patty and John, who didn't hesitate to study the picture themselves. Patty slowly but surely came to understand that the lady in the photo was her daughter. The biggest clue? She stated Tara had been in a car accident as a girl and battled a leg injury that left her with a scar along her thigh and pointed to a discolored streak along the bound woman's thigh in the Polaroid. Not only that, but if one looks closer at the image, one can make out a book sitting next to the woman. The book in question was My Sweet Audrina by V.C. Andrews. Coincidentally, or maybe not, one of Tara Calico's favorite books by one of her favorite authors. 
Investigators on Terra's case agreed that there were enough similarities to warrant professional analysis and multiple agencies took a closer look. However, out of three detailed inspections, the results were inconclusive. Scotland Yard said the bound woman was Terra, the Los Alamos National Laboratory said it wasn't Terra, and the FBI could not make an official conclusion. The naysayers had plenty of their own physical traits to emphasize. First and foremost, the bound woman's facial features didn't quite match Tara's. Their eyebrows are of distinctly different shapes, as well as their overall draw lines. That being said, we must consider the drastic changes in settings. The Polaroid could not have been taken any sooner than May of 1989. As that specific stock of film hadn't been produced and released until spring of that year. Thus, the photo must be depicting Tara at least seven months after her disappearance and alleged kidnapping. A lot of physical change can happen in that time span, including weight loss that affects the jawline and a lack of hygiene and eyebrow maintenance. But perhaps more importantly, the Polaroid scenario would include months of being lodged in a tight space. Months of anxiety, months of stress. Of course, there will be noticeable differences to studio-lit makeup and style portraits most used to compare Tara to the bound woman. These are arguments to both sides of the equation, but ultimately, there is too little information in the Polaroid to make an affirmation regarding Tara. Of course, there is an entirely separate mystery in the Port St. Joe photograph as well. The little boy laying next to the bound woman deserves equal attention. When the Polaroid first made waves around Bellin, New Mexico, and the state in general, many people wondered if the male subject was Michael Henley, a young boy who went missing five months before Tara in April of 1988. He too disappeared in New Mexico during a hunting trip with his father. He had wandered away from the campsite one day and vanished with searching crews unable to find a shred of evidence. While he had no personal relationship with Tara or the Dole family, his physical characteristics also matched the bound boy and relatives of the Henley family agreed it was probably him. How or why they'd be together was cloudy, but if a serial kidnapper was abound in New Mexico, it wasn't outside the realm of possibility that they'd been secluded together across the country. However, this theory went moot a year later in June of 1990. When Michael's remains were found buried in the Zuni Mountains of New Mexico, a forensic analysis found that Michael had most likely died of exposure in the wilderness after wandering off from the campsite, which was seven miles from the excavation zone. The campsite was also only 75 miles away from Tara's disappearance. But when Michael's fate was learned, the connection to Tara dissolved and the bound boy in the photograph remained unidentifiable. Just another, unexplainable story associated with the strangers in the mysterious Port St. Joe Polaroid. While the Polaroid controversy spawned thousands of theories on its own, none were weighed as more probable as the one that surfaced in 2008 by law enforcement themselves. After years of stale leads and a spiraling investigation, the then Valencia County Sheriff, Rene Rivera, said he actually knew what happened to Tara that September morning. In 1988, the Valencia County News Bulletin reported on the 19th anniversary of the disappearance that Rivera, quote, received information over the years that two men who were teenagers at the time of Tara's disappearance found her riding her bike on the rural road that day and had help afterwards disposing of her body. He continued detailing his theory through a play-by-play -play of the morning itself that the two men were taunting Tara in the back of a pickup truck. Hit her bike causing her to lose control and fall, kidnapped her and then killed her when she threatened to contact authorities out of panic. Rivera went on to say that the reason he couldn't act on the tips or arrest those responsible was because there was no concrete evidence to convict, specifically Tara's body or place of burial. However, he did believe that it was likely still in Valencia County and most likely in the general area of those railroad tracks. Rivera wouldn't even release the names he had in relation to the theory, making many citizens, including stepfather John Dole, curious why he would make the claim in the first place. Rivera countered and said that he made the announcement in hopes it would persuade the perpetrators or anyone with information about Tara's resting place to come forward and bring legal closure to the Calico and Dole families. Yet, no matter how much the sheriff pleaded, no one came forward. And his desperate conclusion ended up causing more pain than it relieved. With this in mind, Sheriff Rivera's theory does match a recorded incident left behind in Tara Calico's case documents, now available in the public record. 
Inside of the document, a section contains an interview with Henry Brown, New Mexico citizen who was since perished due to failing health. The interview, which some label as more of a confession, is held by Sheriff Deputy Frank Mithila, who was specifically requested by Brown when he was asked to come in and share his side of the Terra Calico story. Frustratingly, there is no date connected to this event, but it is believed to have taken place years after the disappearance. In the interview, Brown recounts his times hanging around fellow Valencia County teenagers, led by troublemaker Lawrence Romero Jr., the son of the old sheriff. Lawrence Romero Sr. He said Lawrence Jr. was a drug peddler and interested in dating Tara Calico, but was never considered because, according to Brown, Tara was dating a man by the name of Jeff Abhita. Brown continued, recalling that he was at a party attended by Lawrence Jr. and his other mischievous friends in the basement underneath Lawrence Jr.'s trailer, and that Lawrence told him he and the guys had hit Tara on her bike with their truck, raped her, and murdered her. Lawrence Jr. informed Brown that they had originally just tossed the body in some nearby bushes, but became paranoid in light of the police searches and transferred her body to the makeshift trailer basement and later to a nondescript pond. Funnily enough, Henry Brown was not the only person to tell this story to authorities. Another man named Donald Dutcher also informed police in 2013 that a suspect had confessed their heinous crime to him. But he didn't have an exact location on the body either. Coincidental or not, neither Brown nor Dutcher's stories could be confirmed by Lawrence Jr. or his friends themselves because they had all in fact died by the time of the interviews. Lawrence died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound and conspirators claimed there was a suicide note with a confession to Tara's murder. But if it did exist, Rivera never entered it into evidence. Another questionable decision. The case documents also fail to mention reliable sources of the names of the other criminals, but Bellin residents and others with knowledge of the case confirm that the legitimate suspects did indeed die before they were able to be called forward. So the question remains, if this theory holds serious weight, is it truly a lack of physical evidence keeping police from taking it to the prosecutor's office, or is there a cover-up in play by the Valencia County Sheriff Office? Obviously, the main suspect being the son of a former sheriff raises a major red flag, and the cloudiness of a written confession raises speculative suspicion. But it goes without saying, the two separate interviews with the same story have to be considered legitimate. It's a shame the suspects themselves are no longer with us, and the amount of time that has passed since Tara's disappearance does not bode well for an unknown accomplice to randomly come forward and share further details. But it does match multiple witness testimonies regarding rough riders in a pickup truck tailing Tara during her bike rides. Certain details are clunky, such as the information that Tara was seeing a man named Jeff and not Jack Cole, a drug dealer nonetheless, and the last person on earth any of her friends could see her dating. But the theory does give a thorough reasoning why Tara's body was never recovered. Being hidden amongst the vast New Mexico wilderness and ignored by those with the ability to recover her. This is a truly dastardly act of injustice and corruption if true. Of course, there are plenty of other hypotheses surrounding Terra Calico. Like any prominent missing persons case broadcast on national networks, plenty of possible sightings came into law enforcement and television networks. Regular people claiming they've seen Terra with suspicious individuals or walking freely among the streets. However, most of these sightings came in Florida after the Polaroid mishap, most likely the results of phenomenon bias. People were much more willing to believe they had seen Tara after thinking she was held hostage somewhere in the Sunshine State, a combination of wanting a solution to be born of a possibility and to play the hero in an unsolvable mystery. They thought Tara may have fled on her own, explaining the added vanishing of her bike and the breadcrumb trail to nowhere made up by her broken Walkman. Yet the theory made no sense when considering her healthy home life, relationships, and drive to finish school. There were absolutely no warning signs of abandonment, and Tara had plans in place to make sure she wouldn't get lost, a far cry from a scheme to dissolve into the faraway world. Another prominent theory put Tara's fate in the hands of an elaborate kidnapper, a serial criminal with a twisted mind and a knack for public attention. This idea was born not just from the one Polaroid found in Port St. Joe's, but from a series of photos found by outsiders and received by Florida police. In addition to the first picture, another Polaroid image was discovered at a construction site in California, depicting a young woman gagged and seemingly under distress. 
The picture was up close and blurry, but the woman once again bore a few similarities to Tara, and the fabric in the background could have been a match to a fabric seen in the Port St. Joe's Polaroid. The third image came from an unconfirmed location, but depicted a woman tied to an Amtrak sitting next to a male figure laughing. This female showed even fewer comparisons to Tara, and the entire situation was widely believed to be staged and never seriously considered by investigators. In a strange twist, 20 years after the Polaroids were found, another set of printed pictures entered the case. Chief David Barnes of Port St. Joe's Police Department received two envelopes, postmarked June 10 and August 10, 2009, from Albuquerque, New Mexico. The first envelope contained a photograph of a brown-haired boy with a black, sharp-drawn band of tape over his mouth. The second envelope contains the original, unaltered photo of the same boy. Then, two days later on August 12, Port St. Joe newspaper, the star received a third envelope. Again, postmarked August 10th in Albuquerque, it contained another photo of a boy with more black sharp drawn over his mouth. It's unknown if the boys were the same person in each mailing, but investigators initially wondered if they were somehow connected to Tara Calico's case due to the same locations. Matching her profile. Unfortunately, there were no letters in the envelopes containing identities or any clues at all. But perhaps strangest of all, these envelopes were obtained the same time a self-proclaimed psychic was calling into Port St. Joe PD, talking about dreams she had of Tara dying and being buried in California after running away. She also mentioned she met a girl at a strip club who claimed to be Tara. But that girl was located and mistakenly identified. Conspiracy theorists think that both incidents are connected, that either the psychic caller was also the person sending in the envelopes as a means to find attention or the work of a serial kidnapper playing a Zodiac Killer level prank on local authorities and news stations. They believe Tara was kidnapped and driven around the county in the back of a van. And that she was the girl in at least the Port St. Joe photograph and possibly the girl in the other Polaroids as well. Could the psychic have been a legitimate suspect? Multiple agencies ruled them out, calling it a hoax, but many have their doubts, pointing at the piling circumstantial evidence to be more than a mere coincidence. I believe that everyone on Earth has the potential to do wonderful things. But there are undoubtedly those who exemplify the absolute brightest version of humanity, who go out of their way to bring peace to others, to bring a smile to the faces of everyone they meet, seemingly without any effort. People who look after their friends and families and even strangers before themselves, who know that the only way to push us forward as a society is to surround ourselves with happiness, selflessness, and charity, people who were quick to encourage, slow to judge, and effervescently authentic, everyday heroes. Elizabeth Barraza was one of these people, a shining star and great influence on all she met. A child of the 1990s and native of Southeast Texas, Elizabeth, called Liz by all who knew her, grew up infatuated with fantasy, storytelling, and pop culture. Her love of imagination and specifically science fiction fandom was nurtured by her father, Robert Jr. She was particularly fond of Star Wars, growing up with the movies and later exploring the rich worlds provided in television series, comic books, and novels. If there weren't any new expanded universe books to pick up, Liz would turn to her other escapist entertainment, Harry Potter. Liz was a self-described Potterhead, an expert in all things witchcraft and wizardry. She was first in line to grab a copy of every new release and like Star Wars, spent endless hours of childhood wrapped up in the comfort and confines of their creativity. Her own imagination molded by the adventures she was so absorbed with. Alongside her love of the premier pop culture lexicon, Liz also discovered a strong skill set in arts and crafts. She was a meticulous costumer, able to construct complex designs and outfits matching her favorite movie and comic book characters. As she grew older, she discovered there was an entire community of hundreds of thousands of fellow costume fanatics and creatives. This turned Liz on to comic conferences around the United States, where fans would come together dressed head to toe in homemade costumes and show off their intricate creations, a hobby known as cosplaying. It was through cosplaying and a love of Star Wars that Liz became quite close to Sergio Barraza, a fellow Texas native and entranced by the escapist pastime himself. In the winter of 2014, the pair got married and combined their love of Star Wars and cosplaying together. 
The newlywed couple would travel to various comic cons around their home state and America at large, showcasing Liz's expert crafting capabilities. When they weren't dressing up for comic conventions, Liz and Sergio were taking part in the 501st Legion, a world-renowned group of the biggest Star Wars fans who dress up in screen-accurate replicas of Star Wars' most notorious villains and their costumes. This wasn't just any old hobby, however. The 501st Legion consists of over 14,000 volunteers who use their costumes and cosplaying skills to attend charities and hospitals. Visiting sick children and adults alike, raising money for research efforts, medical fundraisers, and the fight against countless diseases. These charitable contributions were a linchpin in Liz's vision for her life. She went above and beyond to attend these visitations and events, bringing joy to so many people whose very lives were in jeopardy. And most importantly, Liz didn't think twice. It was just her nature to give hope to those who needed it. Through their five years together, Liz and Sergio were an immeasurably happy couple. Their tireless work ethic at both their jobs and their recreation did not push them apart, but drew them closer together. To celebrate their five-year anniversary, Liz planned a magical vacation to Orlando, Florida, where Universal Studios awaited them. The couple was excited to visit the new immersive Harry Potter attractions and Liz prepared specially homemade costumes for the pair to wear during their travels. To make things easier on their finances and enjoy the upcoming anniversary without a worry, Sergio and Liz got together some old things from around their house to sell at a garage sale. However, things swiftly took a tragic turn when this innocent attempt to make ends meet resulted in a terrifying murder. Let's now turn to a timeline of events that led to the unsolved murder of Liz Sparazza. It's just after New Year's Day in the year of 2019. Liz and Sergio Barraza celebrate another year of love and success together and prep for their upcoming fifth-year anniversary. The two plot out the perfect celebration, deciding that the new Harry Potter fantasy attractions at Universal Studios Florida would be their dream locale. They chart a course for an end-of-the-month departure and begin preparations. As January progresses, Liz and Sergio realize all of their expenses for the anniversary trip will push them to the max of their budget. Liz also hopes to buy Sergio a couple of gifts herself, and the pair decide to hold a garage sale right before they leave, selling a few odds and ends and items they no longer need from around their house, hoping to raise some spending money for the trip. The end of the month nears and Liz and Sergio finalize the garage sale details. They schedule it middays before they leave for Florida and inform their close friends, families and co-workers of their plans. They do not broadcast it on social media or around the town, however, keeping it close-knit until the day arrives. The final full week of January arrives, and Liz requests time off work for both the vacation and the garage sale. Employed as a data reporter for a pipeline inspection company, Liz is able to get the extended dates approved. On the night of January 24th, Liz and Sergio make their final preparations. Sergio is to go into work as per usual, and Liz says she'll get up early with him to start putting up signs advertising their sale before the sun comes up. The two go to sleep, excited at the prospects that await them, unknowing of the horrors lurking as well. The rooster crows the following morning on Friday, January 25, 2019. It is barely dawn, and Sergio Barraza gets ready for work while Liz gathers the signage supplies. She goes outside with her husband as he climbs into the truck. Concurrently, security and CCTV cameras capture a 2013 or newer four-door dark-colored Nissan Frontier Pro 4X drive around the Barraza's Tombaugh suburb, a vehicle not recognized by the neighbors and never seen driving around the area at such an early time of day. At around 6.48 a.m., Sergio kisses Liz goodbye and departs in a truck of his own. Captured by CCTV cameras, leaving the housing complex, heading towards his place of employment. Over the next four minutes, Liz takes the signage and begins setting them up in her front lawn for any passersby to notice their pending garage sale. She works alone and seemingly doesn't expect a visitor or anything particular to happen. At around 6.52 a.m., the same Nissan Frontier truck seen driving around earlier is captured once more. On a security camera set up on the doorbell of a neighboring house in the Tombaugh suburb, facing the front yard of Liz Barraza's home, where she continues working outside. The dark-colored truck passes the house and parks in another home's driveway. 
From the driver's seat, a person with either long hair or a wig exits the vehicle and walks towards the spot where Liz places a sign. The pursuant, wearing what could either be a trench coat or a long robe, conceals something as they walk up to Liz. Liz looks up, startled, but doesn't run away. Only eight seconds pass of what appears to be a quiet conversation before the figure in the long garment pulls out a gun and shoots Liz three times at point-blank range. The killer then steps over Liz's body, seemingly checking for something before firing off one final point-blank shot. As the clock ticks forward to 6.53 a.m., the shooter sprints from Liz's body back to their truck. They hop inside, back out of the driveway, and drive up and down the street once more, almost as if observing the crime scene before peeling out from the neighborhood, away from the cameras, and forever into anonymity. At the same time, a male subject who heard the gunfire and saw the truck escape runs outside and calls 911 to report both the shooting and ask for an emergency medical response. Meanwhile, another neighbor who comes outside in response to the commotion quickly understands what has happened and personally calls Sergio to inform him Liz has been shot. Not even 10 minutes go by and Sergio returns to the neighborhood to tend to his critically injured wife. Medical and emergency response personnel join him and Liz is rushed to the hospital. Meanwhile, police begin interviewing neighbors to try and find out exactly what transpired. Liz makes it to the hospital, still breathing with a heartbeat. However, after surviving through the night, the following day on Saturday, January 26th, she succumbs to the gunshot wounds and passes away. Soon after, on the investigation side of the ordeal, authorities are quick to label the death a murder, as the crime scene suggests an execution-like shooting combined with the eyewitness testimony of the male subject who saw the killer flee. Within a matter of weeks, police canvass the tumble suburbs for any and all security footage that may give them a better glimpse of what happened on January 25th at 6.52 a.m. One of the Barraza's neighbors then gives law enforcement a copy of their doorbell cam tape from that morning, the now infamous recording of Liz's final moments. In the coming days, detectives study the security footage and release it to media outlets, hoping someone will come forward to identify either the truck or the shooter. Tips pour in, but nothing substantial rises to the forefront of the case, a case growing colder by the minute. It wouldn't be for another year until the Barraza family finally receives a major update in the investigation. During a one-year memorial held by family members, community members, and members of the 501st Legion in honor of Liz's life at the tail end of January 2020, reporters hear from a lead detective on the case that police have obtained a warrant that could lead them directly to the party responsible. There are no other details given, and the exact type of warrant is not revealed, whether it be an arrest warrant or an evidentiary warrant. Again, however, the lead stopped there without any major announcement until June 30th of 2020. A breaking news bulletin reveals that police unveiled an additional nugget of information stemming from the CCTV footage capturing Liz's murder. Authorities announced after analyzing discernible audio from the recording, it can be said confidently that as the suspect approached Liz at 6.52 a.m., Liz could be heard saying, good morning in response. It is not a major clue, but it does make detectives wonder if Liz didn't actually know the suspect as opposed to earlier theories. Sadly, that news alert on June 30th is the last piece of evidence the public has received in Liz Barraza's case. As of today, Liz's brutal murder remains unsolved. The investigation did undergo a change in top leadership, so that must be considered as to why there are apparently no sizable leads despite almost two years of sleuthing, as well as the global pandemic slowing down the world in general beginning in March of 2020. All that being said, police maintain that this case is still very much solvable and will continue to pursue any and all leads provided by the public or otherwise. Without a doubt, the biggest and really the only case point in the Barraza investigation is the CCTV security footage procured from around the crime scene by police in the direct aftermath of January 25th senseless murder. The video shows the murder take place, albeit from a distant and grainy point of view. However, it also shows the suspect flee and most importantly, the side profile of the Nissan Frontier Pro 4X driven by the shooter. Before I play the video in its entirety, as first released by authorities, I want to be upfront about the disturbing nature of the footage. The shooting depicted is real. 
And if you understandably wish to avoid seeing any sort of extreme violence, it would be best to fast forward or turn away for the next few minutes. I want to give you fair warning. So please be advised, what you're about to witness may be hard to watch. What you have just seen is the murder of Liz Barraza. As you saw, a figure with long hair, a long coat or robe, and what could be boots, parks across the street from the Barraza residence, walks over to the front yard where Liz works on the garage sale sign, confronts her with eight seconds of unknown dialogue, then shoots her four times at point-blank range before standing over her body and running off. The most contested part of the video is whether or not the shooter is a woman, as it might seem at first glance, or a man dressed to appear as a woman. It truly is hard to tell. Some point to the end of the video where the killer runs away, stating that the gate is most often attributed to the form of a female run. However, it is also widely believed that the killer was wearing boots as a part of their peculiar getup, and that may have changed the appearance of their movement. Nevertheless, we don't share this video to determine whether or not the killer was male or female or disguised or in plain clothes. It's meant to spread awareness and hopefully catch the eye of someone who hasn't seen it before, recognizing something that could be game-changing, a vital clue. If anything in this video rings a bell, even the slightest memory in the back of your mind, whether it be the identity of the shooter or the origin of the Nissan Frontier truck, contact Crime Stoppers at 713-222 tips. Let us now turn to the most prominent theories that attempt to explain the unsolved murder of Liz Barraza. Because of how recent the Liz Barraza murder case is, the theories surrounding it are few and far between. Both its recency and a withholding of most case details by law enforcement are to blame for this. But that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Police usually keep important clues and even pieces of evidence that don't seem relevant close to their chest in order to avoid tipping off the real suspects of their findings or threatening their chances of making an arrest. It's why studying cold cases within their first few years of investigation are so tricky. There simply isn't enough yarn to thread together a solid board of theories, at least not yet. However, there are still some ideas. One of the very early hypotheses speculated by case followers was that either Sergio or Liz was involved in a secret love triangle and the shooter from the video is an enraged lover or person who was intimately involved with one of the members of the couple. However, we don't believe this is the case. Personal and melodramatic gossip often circulates after a murder. And it can be harmful to the Barraza family and disrespectful to the memory of Liz herself if presented without any real evidence. In fact, there is a very simple and straightforward observation regarding this theory that helps delegitimize it from rampant belief. If there was indeed a love triangle and a secret partner involved, there would be a paper trail or at least a digital one. There would be emails or texts or some sort of communication remaining on a phone or a computer. A forgotten voicemail or letter or something left over to make a connection. The absence of any evidence of this nature speaks for itself. It also shouldn't have to be said, but Sergio himself has been very clear and concise with police and has fully cooperated with both law enforcement and the media. He has shown no signs he has something to hide. And until police uncover something to the contrary, we must focus on other possibilities than those that likely end up in a tabloid magazine. Of course, the shooter could be connected via a close relationship to either Liz or her husband, but to immediately point fingers towards a scandalous extramarital affair would be jumping the gun. Another commonly held belief about who the killer could be is that they met Liz somewhere at a comic book convention or similar cosplaying event and for whatever reason, fixated on her with the intent to murder. But why or how could this happen? One explanation is the passion behind fan-based activities such as Comic-Cons and other global events is normally brought to the absolute extreme. It regrettably doesn't take long when investigating some pastimes such as these to find there is a history of toxic fandom, misogyny and elitism. Certainly not in the majority, but that 1% is known to exist. Of course, cosplaying and passionate fandoms are a good thing, full of good people with good intentions and are meant for escapism and passion. But there are cases where people have taken their favorite pop culture iconography a little too far. And that bad blood has been known in the past to spill over into nefarious and criminal territory. 
Thus, it is suggested that somewhere along their travels or even in an online community, Liz met someone who became overly jealous of her or Sergio, made advances, and when they didn't get what they wanted, went after her in the most horrific way possible. Now, while this is also somewhat unlikely to not have a trail of communication somewhere on the internet for police to track, it's possible this connection was made in person and the killer was an unknown stalker, following Liz around and waiting for her to be alone. There have been confirmed cases of women being stalked at comic conventions before, and has even led to abuse and assaults. It is not a common occurrence, but it has happened frequently enough for some to consider it in connection with Liz's case. The biggest criticism to the cosplay-related stalker theory is how out of place the subject was in Tombaugh itself. The neighbors never reported seeing the Nissan Frontier truck in the housing complex prior to that night. And it wasn't recorded on CCTV cameras in the hours or days leading up to the murder. For the stalker to have been following Liz leading up to the shooting, they would have had to stalk her discreetly, using another vehicle and tracking her every movement to confirm that she would be alone when she was. Because the garage sale was not widely broadcast or marketed to the public, the stalker wouldn't have known to go out to the neighborhood that morning. Coincidentally showing up would require an intense amount of dumb luck. And by all accounts, this was a calculated assassination beyond the odds of pure fortune. We must also remember that the stalker was wearing what some believe is a disguise in the security footage with a long robe and possible wig hiding their true identity. It is possible that the stalker was going an extra mile to hide who they really are, but that also goes against what a stalker typically is. Someone in the shadows undetected, a disguise not necessary. That is unless the shooter wasn't a random stalker, but someone with a more personal relationship to Liz, who somehow knew about the garage sale. Again, this is banking on the idea that detectives did not obtain a list of everyone who knew about the garage sale and clear them of involvement. If they did, which frankly should have been routine investigative work, it would be immensely difficult to slip through the cracks. This is unless the friend or co-worker rented a car, or better yet, borrowed one from a friend or family member. This way, if the cops searched car rentals from around the area for that exact model of a Nissan Frontier Pro 4X, the subject would sneak through the cracks without a public or even private record connecting them with anything. And while it seems perhaps overly elaborate for a killer to rent a car for use in a murder plot, keep in mind that many think the shooter was also wearing a disguise, the longer hair appearing more like a wig than a natural hairstyle. Of course, this is impossible to discern on such a low-quality camera feed and can neither be confirmed nor denied. But if the killer dressed up, they may also have used a car under someone else's name, knowing there could be many prying eyes identifying the make and model of their getaway vehicle. Overall, however, the idea that the killer was a personal friend is hard to make sense of when considering the most recent update from law enforcement regarding the first word spoken by Liz when the shooter approached her. An unexcited good morning that was described by law enforcement as a greeting someone would extend to a stranger or passerby doesn't give much credence to the thought that Liz knew her killer. Again, this loops back to the disguise theory. Liz simply may not have recognized her killer at first glance. We also must remember that it was just 6.50 in the morning in the very early phases of daylight. The shadows of twilight may have cloaked the face of the perpetrator. We also don't know what exactly the killer and Liz spoke about in the 8 seconds between good morning and gunfire. Once the killer got close, Liz may very well have realized who it was. The CCTV footage doesn't reveal any sign of alarm or attempt to flee by Liz, but the gunmen also drew their weapon quickly, allowing very little time to react. There are admittedly many holes with this theory, but it is also only one breakthrough or piece of evidence away from explaining everything. Sadly, for now, it is too vague to be counted on. The final theory most discussed by Sleuth so far is that the shooter is a contract killer. Someone who was hired by an associate or even a stalker of Liz's to kill her that fateful morning. This would explain all the irregularities of the video and the situation at large as we currently see them. A contract killer who has no connection to the Barraza household wouldn't be identified by Liz herself. The vehicle would not be traced to any of her family and friends, and they would have been given the garage sale information by whoever hired them or asked them to do such a terrible thing. Obviously, this depends on the idea that it was someone who knew about the garage sale that sealed Liz's fate. 
But the way that the perpetrators truck drove around the neighborhood that morning makes us believe that they knew Liz would eventually be alone that day, understanding Sergio would go to work while Liz set up the supplies. There's even a hypothesized conversation to go with this theory, with some thinking that the eight-second conversation before the muzzle flashes consisting of the killer asking if Liz was who she really was, if her garage sale was really a garage sale, and then firing the gun when Liz confirmed this. It should be noted that if the killer was hired by contract, they were by no means a professional assassin or had much experience in violent crime. Someone who murders with intent per contract surely wouldn't have been so obvious, would have used silencing techniques for maximum stealth, and most certainly wouldn't have done it wearing a pair of boots and a long flowing robe. There are of course, thousands of characters around the country that might fit that bill, but a hired gunman likely isn't one of them. Is this by design, another way to camouflage intent with ridiculousness? It can't be ruled out, but at this point, everything is still in play. Tammy Alexander was born on November 2, 1963 in Atlanta, Georgia to parents Joe Alexander and Barbara Jenkins. From birth through childhood, Tammy lived through incredibly turbulent and terrifying times. Her parents negligent and filling the household with dread, their unruly choices permeating into the psyche and overall emotions of their children. As a mere toddler, Tammy would walk in on her mother abusing pills in the bathroom, addicted to prescription medicine after Tammy's father, Joe, moved out. These bouts with addiction and other mental illnesses spiraled into occasional suicide attempts, including times where Barbara would slit her wrists right in front of her own daughter. Despite the chaos and Barbara's endangerment to both her family and herself, there was no true intervention during Tammy's early years. While she did survive with the help of the infrequent relative or family friend, Barbara never achieved the help she needed and the hardships carried over into Tammy's adolescence. After Joe Alexander left Tammy and her mother, however, Barbara did bear another daughter with a different man. Tammy was blessed with a half-sister and family ally in Pamela Dyson. The two girls used each other as lifelines during the rough bounce at home. And cloned to each other's spirits when the tides of terror rolled in. Sadly, Pamela was subject to the same tantrums as Tammy, and she would later tell reporters that had Barbara been properly diagnosed by a mental health professional, she would have received treatment and she and Tammy would have lived much more peaceful lives. Nevertheless, the sisters fought onward, and at age 11, Pamela escaped the Jenkins household to live with her paternal grandmother. She presumed Tammy was able to find a similar escape and move in with fellow relatives, but little did she know Tammy continued to be stuck in the presence of her volatile mother, left to process that trauma alone and into her teenage years. Luckily, Tammy's end of middle school and beginning of high school years weren't completely isolating. At school, Tammy was able to form a few close friendships with like-aged girls in her Brooksville, Florida classrooms. One girl in particular was Laurel Noel, who shared multiple personality traits with Tammy and quickly clicked with her go-getting demeanor. Laurel and Tammy would often write letters to one another, Tammy consistently informing Laurel of her most recent boy crushes and desire to escape their Brooksville home. Soon after their high school careers began, Tammy found love in another classmate, an older boy named Kevin Williams. Tammy was certain she wanted to marry Kevin despite their relative youth. In helping end meet, Tammy joined her mother, Barbara, as a waitress at a local truck stop, bussing tables and collecting tips to prepare for her future abroad and away from trouble. In an intriguing twist though, trouble still followed Tammy despite her best intentions. Due to her crumbling relationship with her mother, Tammy often sought temporary escapes from her home in Brooksville. And she and her friend Laurel would hitchhike around the country as means of adventure. Often they would go places they had no connection to, just two teenage girls wandering the open United States. One time the pair hitchhiked all the way to California. However, upon arrival, Laurel called her parents out of confusion and Mr. and Mrs. Noel flew both their daughter and Tammy back to Brooksville. Tammy's parents, however, didn't seem to care. And she often wrote new letters to Laurel, professing her desire to hitchhike again, viewing these cross-country escapades as fun journeys, never questioning the overall safety of their trips. These letters would become the defining artifacts of Tammy's final weeks alive and well. She and Laurel weren't always on the same page about things. Like many high school friendships, they took part in their fair share of arguments. But one thing was for certain in the letters. 
Tammy was not just a person defined by her rough upbringing or occasional carelessness. Rather, Tammy displayed a natural charisma, an enigmatic mode of operating that reflected her love of independence. Tammy was strong-willed and vastly imaginative and above all, incredibly introspective. In tune with her emotions, while understanding exactly what she wanted, she sought a sturdy life. At least something sturdier than she knew as a child, hopeful for a post-grad marriage and a happy life far, far away. Her exuberance pushed her to new heights and tragically to new places for unknown reasons. For in 1979, Tammy Jo Alexander went missing from her sleepy town in central Florida, only to be found dead in autumn of that same year, left unidentified as the Cali Jane Doe. For over 35 years. Let's now turn to the timeline of events leading up to Tammy's disappearance. The last stretch of Tammy Alexander's known whereabouts begin at 11.35 p.m. on May 26, 1979, in Brooksville, Florida. She writes a final letter to her best friend, Laurel Noel, announcing her desire to get married before the year is out. And her plan to leave the Sunshine State in September of the following year. The letter acts as a goodbye of sorts due to Laurel and Tammy's impending parting of ways. This would be the last time Laurel hears from her childhood friend. A short while after Tammy sends her final letter to Laurel, around the time spring transitions to summer of 1979, Tammy ends up at the Rainbow Prison Ministry in Young Harris, Georgia. Young Harris is a rural yet mountainous region in the northern sector of Georgia, and the Rainbow Prison Ministry hosts inmates who have either been released on parole or on probation. However, why Tammy attends the camp is unknown and could either be as a volunteer of sorts through a summer school program or an actual attendee, considering her runaway incidents in Florida, seeking an alternative form of corrections. Yet none of Tammy's friends nor family know of her whereabouts. And assume she has run away again. During Tammy's stay at the prison ministry in July of 1979, she leaves a series of voice recordings via phone for her boyfriend, Kevin Williams, who remains back in Florida. Kevin isn't privy to Tammy's exact location, but in her messages, she sounds at peace and hopeful, not at all disturbed nor in danger, thus prompting no anxious reaction from Kevin. This is the last confirmed communication made by Tammy. Later that summer, Tammy's trace disappears. She theoretically leaves the ministry in Young Harris, Georgia and travels either back to Florida or westward. Due to her history of hitchhiking and taking rides from strangers, it's believed that Tammy journeys on a cross-country road trip with strangers and most likely not by herself for the time being. As the dog days of summer give way to the mild chills of autumn, Tammy remains missing from her Brooksville community. She continues to travel, most likely northeastward this time around. Either at the end of October or the beginning of November that year, Tammy lands in upstate New York. How she gets here or why she chooses this location is unknown, but again, she is most likely accompanied by either one or multiple companions. In the early evening hours of Friday, November 9, 1979, Tammy is reportedly spotted at a diner in Lima, New York, a small town of less than 4,000 people in the northwest area of the state. A waitress who later accounts as an eyewitness serves a girl matching Tammy's description and an older male figure who accompanies her. Tammy doesn't appear distressed or in any real danger, and the male figure pays for the meal. Before departing with Tammy a little while later. This is the last known sighting of Tammy Jo Alexander. Later that night of November 9th, Tammy is taken to a road on the edge of a farm in Caledonia, New York of Livingston County, another small town only a 20-minute drive west of the Lima Diner, along Interstate 20 and New York State Route 5, 23 miles south of Rochester. Here, she is shot in the back of the head once via handgun, stripped of all identification and dragged into the neighboring cornfield. In the field, the perpetrator fires one more bullet into Tammy's back and leaves her for dead. The gunshot wounds hemorrhage and Tammy passes away before sunrise, her murderer escaping into the night. As the clock strikes midnight and the calendar flips to Saturday, November 10th, a series of rainstorms hit upstate New York and wash away most of the evidence from Tammy's body, vital DNA destroyed, and Tammy Alexander's story is blemished almost beyond any understanding. The following morning, a Caledonia farmer awakens and walks outside to check on his pastures after the inclement weather of the night before. As he approaches the cornfields, the farmer spots a bit of red fabric settled in the distance. 
Believing it to be a trespassing hunter or unwanted visitor, the farmer approaches with caution. Upon reaching the red clothing, however, the farmer instead finds the body of a young girl shot twice and covered with dirt. He quickly returns to his farmhouse and alerts the police. Not long afterwards, authorities show up at the scene and begin collecting evidence. They find a small pool of blood on the edge of the cornfield where the girl was shot. Along with the trail leading from the blood to the body. The body itself shows no signs of sexual assault and was fully closed. However, her pant pockets had been turned inside out as if ransacked prior to abandonment. At the coroner's office later in November, the medical examiner notices that the gunshot wounds indicate that the girl had not flinched or moved as she was shot, a peculiar yet common phenomenon in murder cases. The coroner is unable to find anything else peculiar though, and rules the death as a homicide while the police continue searching for the girl's identity. As November 1979 comes to a close, law enforcement announced the female corpse as the Caledonia Jane Doe, failing to find her family, origin points, or even name. She is initially described as a young girl between the ages of 13 and 19. Standing is around 5 foot 3 inches and weighing around 120 pounds, with brown eyes, wavy brown hair at shoulder length that had been dyed four months prior to death and coral-colored nail polish painted on her toenails. She displays no signs of dental work. Her blood type comes back as a negative and her stomach contains sweet corn, potatoes and canned ham. The analysis of the composition and mineral content in her teeth reveal a North American drinking water pattern. Despite these revelations and biological clues, police are unable to identify the Cali Jane Doe as 1979 comes to a close. About a year later, on October 20, 1980, authorities release a sketch of the Cali Jane Doe. Asking for anyone who recognizes the girl to come forward with information. Her case is quickly shipped to major news networks, and before long, the entire state of New York is searching for Cali Doe's identity. Even with the advanced efforts of investigators to share the Cali Doe story with the general public, very little advancements are made in the case over the next few years as the 1980s progress. A few tips here and there make their way to the proper channels, but none turn out to be of any use. The first major bend in the case arrives in 1984, when the notorious serial killer Henry Lee Lucas, murderer of 11 women and friend of fellow murderer Otis Toole, confesses to Texas State Rangers while in prison that he had killed the unidentified girl known as Caledonia Jane Doe. Back in 1979 without ever giving away her true identity. Rangers relay this information to fellow New York State detectives. However, even through joint investigations, each branch is unable to find sufficient evidence in this claim. Lucas's involvement is then all but ruled out in 1985, when it's discovered that he had falsely confessed to over 100 murders in which he had zero connection. It is widely believed that the Caledonia Confession is one of these 100-plus bogus claims. As the 1980s come to a close, police interview their fair share of other serial killers and small criminals with potential links to Caledonia. However, none prove fruitful and the case remains as cold as it was that November morning of 1979. In 1989, newly elected Sheriff of Livingston County, New York, John York, promises the public that the Cali Doe investigation will remain active as long as he remains Sheriff. York was deputy sheriff and one of the first responding officers at the scene of the crime and acts as the strongest voice for the still unidentified teenage girl well into the new millennia. Over 15 years pass until the next major development in 2005. When forensic scientists perform a successful DNA extraction from Cali Doe's remains due to improved technology. This allows for the possibility that her identity will be found someday through another DNA sample match. Another break in the case helps authorities inch closer to solving Callie Dew's mystery one year later in 2006, when an analysis of her teeth display an isotopic oxygen ratio. Hinting she may have been from the south or southwestern regions of the United States. These tests are paired with a paleological analysis done on the Cali Doe's clothing, in which pollen pulled from her body can be traced back to trees grown in California, Arizona, and other southwestern regions in the United States, leading investigators to recognize that their Cali Doe was not a Caledonia native. 
A few years later in 2010, Web Sleuth's moderator and California artist, Carl Koppelman catches wind of the ongoing Cali Du Cold case and opts to perform a facial reconstruction of the girl's profile in hopes that a newly drawn image will aid both investigators and the general public in identifying the body. The facial reconstruction is uploaded to the National Missing and Unidentified Person System. Also known as the NAMAS database, but no new information is discovered. Coincidentally, around the same time in 2010, Laurel Noel, Tammy Alexander's best friend from Brooksville, starts searching for her old high school classmate via social media, but cannot find Tammy or her name on any internet platform. As the next few years trickle by, Laurel doesn't give up her efforts. She eventually reaches out to Pamela Dyson, Tammy's half-sister, who now resides in Panama City, Florida. Pamela tells Laurel that she moved away from Tammy and their mother, Barbara, when she was only 11 to live with other relatives and figures Tammy did the same not long afterwards. However, both women also discuss Tammy's inclinations to run away from home and wonder if she simply left Brookville to start her own life, free from her haunted history in central Florida. When Laurel informs Pamela of her own research and the lack of Tammy's presence on the internet, Pamela digs deeper into the connections with the surviving members of the Alexander family and learns that Tammy hasn't been heard from since her initial disappearance in 1979. Barbara Jenkins, the girl's mother, had died in 1998 and listed Tammy as deceased in her obituary, a commonly held belief when she had never returned home after the summer of 1979. In 2014, both Laurel and Pamela share with one another their concern that Tammy had wandered along a dangerous path after she vanished and wonder if she is a victim to an unknown crime. Pamela tells Laurel that she believes police may not have taken a missing person's report seriously if they knew about Tammy's hitchhiking history. And so even if Barbara had filed one, it may have been disregarded or lost. Thus, in August of 2014, Pamela and Laurel pay a visit to the Hernando County Sheriff's Office in Central Florida to inquire about a missing persons report for Tammy Jo Alexander. The officers at the station check and say no report had ever been filed in 1979 or since, so the two women file one, and the authorities launch an official investigation. About one month later, in September of 2014, the Cali Doe artist, Carl Koppelman, spots the new listing for Tammy Alexander on the NAMAS database and realizes her face is strikingly similar to the reconstruction of the Caledonia Jane Doe. He promptly emails the Livingston County Sheriff's Office in New York, the Hernando County Sheriff's Office in Florida, the NAMAS Regional Admin, and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Law enforcement quickly responds and arranges a DNA test with Pamela Dyson since her blood relation to Tammy Alexander could provide an accurate match. A few months later, in January of 2015, the DNA results come back to the Monroe County Medical Examiner and reveal Pamela's mitochondrial DNA samples match perfectly with Cali Doe's samples. For the first time in 35 years, detectives know the body's identity, and Pamela knows the tragic fate of her half-sister, Tammy Alexander. Not long after, on January 26, authorities announced during a news conference the identity of the Caledonia Jane Doe, and shift the focus of their investigation from identification to solving Tammy's murder. A mere month passes by, and at the end of February 2015, the Livingston County Sheriff's Office reports that a record number of tips have flooded through their various channels, a drastic change to the slowly decreasing number of leads they had acquired up until then. One call from a Tennessee truck driver gives detectives what they describe as their most sizable development yet. However, what this is is never disclosed. Another month flies by and in March of 2015, the revelation regarding Tammy and her time spent at the Rainbow Prison Ministry is revealed to detectives. However, the young Harris Ministry has long since closed and the husband and wife who started the ministry have passed away along with one of their children. The lack of public information regarding Rainbow Prison Ministry doesn't deter investigators and at least gives a bit of insight into Tammy's final months of life. Details which had been lost for three and a half decades. A few months later, on June 10, 2015, Pamela, Laurel, and about 100 other attendees visit Tammy's Cemetery in Dansville, New York for a ceremony replacing the Jane Doe tombstone with one that reads Tammy Jo Alexander. 
The family decides to keep her in New York rather than transfer her back to Florida, thanking the Livingston County officials for their hard work. On the case In what might be the biggest discovery in Tammy's case since her identification in 2015, another piece of DNA evidence is procured from an auto racing jacket found on her body in early 2016. This sample is different than the one used to identify Tammy Joe and is found to be that of an unknown male subject. Three separate male persons of interest are brought in for questioning. And their DNA is taken in order to match against this new evidence. Almost a year passes until November of 2016, when the Federal Bureau of Investigation, now a major player in the cold murder case, announces none of the three male subjects match the new DNA sample from Tammy's body, but that they are still following any and all leads that they may obtain. The most recent update delivers on what would be Tammy Alexander's 57th birthday, November 2, 2020, when the Livingston County Sheriff's Office releases three segments of the audio recording acquired from her high school boyfriend, Kevin Williams, who had kept a voicemail he received from her on a tape cassette prior to her disappearance in 1979. Detectives hope that someone out there recognizes Tammy's voice from around the time she went missing. Another effort to bring the final closure to a mystery with so many twists and hardly any answers. In most cold case detective investigations, I like to hone in on one specific aspect to the case that signifies the mystery's biggest clue, or in some cases, its most microscopic detail that could cause the fissure needed to crack the case wide open. In regards to Tammy Jo Alexander's murder, I'm gonna bend the rules a bit to highlight two separate case points as they both reflect vital pieces of evidence that we all must take seriously when considering Tammy's case. The first major case point is the description of the male subject seen with the girl thought to be Tammy Alexander at the diner in Lima, New York on the night of November 9, 1979. The man was first spotted and described by the waitress who served him and Tammy, and is thus far the only suspect with a verified eyewitness accounts and corresponding profile. He was a middle-aged white man standing around 5 foot 9 inches. He wore black wire-rimmed glasses and reportedly drove a tan station wagon to and from the diner. The waitress told police that he paid for both his own and Tammy's meal, but never aroused much suspicion or concern. The man in the black-rimmed glasses is still considered a prime suspect by police and his facial composite sketch is still used on wanted posters across the country. You can see a copy of this sketch in the show notes on this podcast. If the man in this drawing is familiar to you, if you recognize his face from the Livingston County, New York area, or any area in general dating back to the late 1970s, please call the Livingston County Sheriff's Office at 1-844-527-6847. The second major case point is the recordings released by police revealing Tammy Alexander's voicemails left to her former boyfriend in 1979. I have three segments here that I will play to you now. These recordings are thought to be from the time Tammy spent at the Rainbow Prison Ministry and showcase her personality mere months before she was killed. These are the three excerpts. Played one after another. Well, hi Kevin, how you doing? I am Fine. That was nice to hear from you. I'm very glad you're better. I gotta go now, so you take care and be careful. Oh, that was cool. I'm looking at it. Moon Atlantic Ocean in Florida. It's got two palm trees, the moon, the flight 10. While investigators have come forward and said they believe there is nothing incriminating or suspicious involved with these recordings, they do give us a rare opportunity to hear Tammy's true self, to get a glimpse, even a small one, into the caring and optimistic person she was, and maybe even trigger someone's memory who may remember hearing that voice back during her final months spent alive in the autumn. Of 1979. While the chances of such recognition happening are slim as it was over four decades ago, cold cases such as these deserve every opportunity to be solved. Every avenue must be explored as far-fetched as it may seem. Again, if you recognize this voice or know someone who might, please share this audio. And call the Livingston County Sheriff's Office at 1-844-527-6847. Now let's turn to the most prominent theories surrounding the murder of Tammy Jo Alexander. For years, the central theories revolving around Tammy's case file focused on her true identity, considering her Jane Doe moniker. Luckily, that aspect of the mystery has been solved. 
and we can focus our theories on who killed her and how she wound up in Caledonia, New York, hundreds of miles away from central Florida. To start, it's vital to track Tammy's first movements when she left in the summer of 1979 to theorize where she may have gone and theorize who she may have met between Brooksville and Livingston County. We do know that Tammy spent time at Rainbow Prison Ministry in Young Harris, Georgia. But where did she go after this? Like many theories surrounding Tammy's murder, we can draw incredibly helpful clues from the clothing she was wearing the night she was killed and the artifacts pulled from her body after her discovery on the morning of November 10th. As we've previously mentioned, scientists completed a paleological analysis of pollen samples extracted from the exterior of her garments in 2006 to trace the origins of the samples and track her movements via United States pollen patterns. The tests were conducted at the Palynology Lab at Texas A&M University, and researchers found four distinct types of pollen grains, that of Australian pine, oak, spruce, and birch trees. These grains were then compared to a controlled sample of pollen grains extracted from the rural upstate New York area in 1978. One year. Before Tammy's tragic arrival. Oak trees are found all across the United States alongside birch and spruce trees, which are especially popular in the state of New York. That being said, there were no oak, spruce or birch pollen grains detected in the 1978 controlled sample. And it should be mentioned that no birch or spruce trees were located in the general vicinity of the body's discovery in Caledonia. In fact, the birch and spruce varieties found on Tammy's clothing were eventually matched with birch and spruce species found most often in the mountainous regions of California, on the other side of the country, and 3,000 miles away from Livingston County. The fourth and final pollen grain extracted from Tammy's person, the Australian pine, is considered an invasive genus. Grown sporadically across the United States and in surrounding countries, but in finite quantities. Australian pine can be found in Mexico, South Texas, South Florida, the campus of Arizona State University, the campus of the University of Arizona, and some regions of California. We know that Australian pine cannot survive the cold winter seasons of upstate New York. Therefore, we know at least one of these strains was picked up away from Caledonia. And the one area that shares overlap in all four pollen grains, the Australian pine, oak, birch, and spruce, is the southwest mountainous area of California, including San Diego. While detectives are confident these findings paint a clearer picture of Tammy's movements prior to death, do a few pollen grains certify Tammy's presence in the southwestern United States? No, but that's not all that hints of her westward journey. Another piece of clothing, or in this instance, jewelry, supports that very theory. A handmade necklace found on Tammy's body the morning of November 10th. The necklace, chain, clasp, and prongs are made of imitation silver with three turquoise stones fitted to each prong, one resembling a bird. You can find a picture of this necklace in the show notes. And craft of the necklace strongly supports a homemade origin as it bears no brand name or identifiable match in any jewelry catalog from the time period. Rather, investigators view the necklace as a replica of Native American jewelry made and sold mostly in the southwestern United States. Of course, there is no way to confirm Tammy didn't already own the necklace prior to her 1979 departure. As she could have potentially brought it at a thrift store or antique stand somewhere in Florida. But experts don't think so. This would be far too coincidental. And it also ties in with Tammy's wishes to return to California that she expressed in her final letters sent to Laurel Noel. So the route that Tammy Alexander most likely took after leaving Young Harris, Georgia tracks southwest across the United States. Through the Bible Belt, through the deserts of Texas and New Mexico, and then through Arizona into Southern California. She most likely stayed in that area for more than a few days, as the tan lines found on her body post-mortem hinted at a lengthy stay in a sunny climate. It was here she probably picked up the regional Australian pine pollen grains and then headed back east. Detectives believe Tammy then tracked through the Sierra Nevada mountain range, picking up the exclusive birch and spruce species of pollen before heading through Nevada and most likely hitchhiking eastward towards New York State. In terms of the remainder of Tammy's belongings, police also recovered two metal keychain pendants, which were traced to vending machines set along the New York State Thruway. 
a series of controlled access highways that cross a mere 4.5 miles north of Caledonia. The pendants were a lock and key style of paired chains and the locket included the inscription, he who holds the key can open my heart. Unfortunately, the key portion was also included on Tammy's body, meaning the perpetrator never took one half of the pendant. This clue doesn't reveal too much, except that Tammy most likely came into New York heading east on Interstate 90. Aside from jewelry, detectives took a deeper dive into the rest of Tammy's outfit to see if they could match anything else to an ulterior source. Most of what was left behind seemed to make sense belonging to a 16-year-old independent teenage girl. The tan corduroy pants, colored, pleated cotton polyester shirt, blue knee-high socks and brown ripple sole shoes all fit Tammy's demographic. However, there was one piece of clothing that did not fit a girl of her age's profile and was thought to belong to another male. A red nylon-lined windbreaker with black stripes along the sleeves with a collar label reading Auto Sports Products Incorporated. This is the garment that included a new DNA sample belonging to an unidentified man and was tested against three other male subjects' DNA in 2015. That DNA has still yet to be matched, but it is widely agreed upon Tammy picked up the red windbreaker on her ventures out west, either on the way there or on the way to New York. Now, this isn't proven to have belonged to the killer himself, since the killer went through the trouble of removing Tammy's other identifiable belongings. But there is a good chance whoever it does belong to knows more about Tammy than anyone else at this point in time. One specific theory attached to the Red Windbreaker does include a possible known killer, Christopher Wilder. Wilder, also known as the Beauty Queen Killer, was an Australian who immigrated to the United States in 1969. He raped 12 women and killed 8 on a cross-country crime spree in a six-week period in early 1984. He is also thought to be the culprit of two statutory rape cases in Florida in 1983, as well as countless unsolved murders, both back home in Australia and in the United States. Wilder's MO was to persuade young women to get into his truck after offering them a modeling contract. Using his background in photography as a means to appear legitimate. The crimes that have been confirmed to have been Wilder's took place all over the country, including Florida, Georgia, Kansas, Texas, Utah, Arizona, and California. But one in particular really stands out. In April of 1984, Wilder abducted a 16-year-old girl named Tina Marie Rizico and forced her to road trip with him. Across the country while helping him abduct other unsuspecting female victims. They eventually reached New York where Wilder again abducted a woman by the name of Beth Dodge before killing her and dumping her in a gravel pit. He then bought a plane ticket 14 Marie back to Los Angeles before heading back out on the road to commit further crimes. One of the elements that makes Wilder such a fitting suspect in relation to Tammy Alexander's murder is the way he traveled while committing crimes and the places he was known to frequent. Tammy was killed five years before Wilder's six-week homicidal spree, but it is possible he was in the United States during that time period, driving across the country, scouting out locations and understanding the general routes between state lines. It is entirely feasible Wilder ran into Tammy during her own adventures out west and pulled the same sickening stunt he would on Tina Marie Rizico half a decade later. But that is not where the suspicions end. Wilder was also a prevalent race car fanatic, even dabbling in stunt driving and other high-speed endeavors himself. In fact, he owned a fair share of merchandise that was manufactured by the same company labeled on Tammy's Red Windbreaker, Auto Sports Productions Incorporated leading investigators to wonder if that jacket Tammy had belonged to Wilder. In addition, Wilder was also known to have used a Colt Python 357 Magnum revolver, a gun that can be used to fire 38 caliber bullets, the type of slug found at Tammy's crime scene. Sadly, the ballistics of Wilder's gun were never tested alongside the bullet found at the cornfield in Caledonia. And Wilder was killed in a standoff with police in Colebrook, New Hampshire, before any interview could ever take place regarding Tammy. It should be noted that Wilder's involvement in Tammy's case was theorized early on in the investigation and prior to the male DNA sample's discovery in 2015. Now it is safe to assume that Wilder's DNA has since been tested against the windbreaker's evidence and rendered not a match. However, until there is an official statement made by the assigned detectives, Christopher Wilder is still a solid suspect in the case. 
Beyond a few other lower-tier criminals investigators have already ruled out using DNA evidence, there just aren't many names tied to Tammy Alexander's murder. One could conceivably still chart Henry Lee Lucas as a possible culprit using his MO and testimony. But remember that officials have his DNA on file as well and have most certainly tested it against the mystery male subject's DNA. Of course, there is also the family left to consider. Anytime a person goes missing, especially an underage teenage girl, the focus always passes over the family. There are those that wonder if Tammy's listing as deceased on her mother Barbara Jenkins' obituary in 1998 wasn't just an assumption, but rather admissible of the fact that her family knew she was dead. As previously mentioned, Barbara had various untreated mental disorders and working at a truck stop with Tammy would have meant frequent encounters with nefarious characters. It's possible Barbara or one of her boyfriends knew about or worse was complicit in Tammy's death and then covered it up using her runaway status against her. It should also be noted that no missing persons report was ever filed, a mistake that could be rendered purposeful. Some theorists also refrain from absolving Kevin Williams, Tammy's high school boyfriend, of any guilt. Kevin was reportedly the last person to hear Tammy alive. And some suggest that if he caught Tammy running away with another guy on one of her hitchhiking escapades, he may have taken things a step too far. However, both we and the authorities do not believe Tammy's family or boyfriend are in any way involved with her disappearance and death. Tammy was rarely home as a teenager, and the fact that her mother and other family members figured she simply ran away in 1979 does make sense when factoring in her known behavior. Kevin Williams has been nothing but helpful throughout the investigation and was only a boy at the time. These theories also do not explain how Tammy had pollen grains from terrain on the opposite side of the country and ended up thousands of miles away from Brooksville, Florida at the time of her murder. These theories simply do not fit in any way, shape or form with the remaining evidence left at Tammy's crime scene and should not seriously be considered by the general public. When considering killers, recall the fact that the detectives have a DNA profile. We don't know for sure it's the killers, but it has likely been used to rule out known players in Tammy's life who are still alive, as well as criminals already included in the FBI's database. Whoever the killer is, they are not someone from Tammy's childhood.